Good morning and welcome to our service of worship. And we're delighted to welcome you wherever we are and we want to welcome you with that wonderful traditional Easter greeting, Christ is risen. I'm going to say that again and may I invite you to respond with that response, he is risen indeed. Christ is risen. We gather in our different homes, wherever we are, and you're very welcome wherever you're coming from. We know we have a number of people joining us who are not members of our own congregation, and you're especially welcome to join as we come to worship. The preacher William Sangster lost his voice towards the end of his life, and he wrote to his daughter, it is terrible to wake up on Easter morning and have no voice with which to shout, he is risen. But he went on to say it would be much more terrible to have a voice and not want to shout. That call of Christ is risen is a call of victory and indeed an act of defiance. The story is told uh, in the Soviet Union in some of the darkest days of communism and one of the leaders was sent from Moscow to Kiev to speak at a rally trying to undermine the existence of God and he spoke at length and after about an hour of ridiculing Christianity and God and as he thought dispelling and disproving the existence of God he invited questions and a man asked to come up onto the platform to speak and as he did so he turned toward the crowd and he said Christ is risen and the echo came back as a crescendo he is risen indeed we may be isolated from each other we may be confined in our respective homes but we can still proclaim that Christ is risen indeed. It's a fact that should shape who we are. I have a couple of brief announcements. We've set up a Facebook page and you can access that through our website and we hope to use it for updates. There's no, there are no magazines this month, but the Herald is available online. Uh, if you go onto our Facebook page, you can get a link to that or indeed through the Presbyterian Ireland website. And do keep in touch with each other and with myself. And I, I want to put up a, a picture now, at least I hope it comes up, one that I meant to show a couple of weeks ago of the McCartney family watching uh, the broadcast on a Sunday morning. We come to worship God. And if we do so, I want to use a traditional responsive greeting from Easter Sunday morning. The response is simply, Alleluia. You'll see it on the screen. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Alleluia. He has defeated the powers of death. Alleluia. He has the words of eternal life. Hallelujah. We're going to join to sing now in the words of our first hymn of praise, a hymn that focuses on that first Easter morning and the joy of the resurrection and its significance for our lives. See what a morning.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, on this Easter Sunday morning, we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that it means. Defeat apparent, erased in victory. The crucifixion is no longer the final verdict. Instead, the cross of shame becomes a work of triumph, of life over death, of good over evil, of sins forgiven and freedom restored. As people of the risen King, we celebrate the triumph of his grace. For we, the guilty ones, go free. For us, the resurrection changes everything. For we are raised with him and we will reign with him. And we rejoice this morning. We also come in confession, or like the disciples, we have often missed the point or thought we knew better. We may even have deserted, possibly denied or conceivably betrayed our risen Lord in our actions, in our reactions or our downright lack of action. We have sinned and fallen short. And we confess our sin, grateful for your promise that he took our sins on himself on the cross. As the prophet Isaiah put it, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to her own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. As we reflect on the significance of that, we are deeply grateful. And together, wherever we are, we join in the words that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning boys and girls. Uh, I've come outside again this morning uh, and this morning I brought my gardening tools with me. Over the past few weeks I've been spending more time than usual uh, in the garden and I've been planting some things. Uh, you'll see here I've planted some flowers, some nasturtium, nasturtiums and they're starting to come up and to grow. And as I think about gardens I realize that in the Bible there are some really important stories that take place in gardens. The Garden of Eden, for example, where God placed Adam and Eve. And also, of course, Jesus talks about planting. In fact, he talked about the importance of a seed going into the ground and dying, as these little seeds have done, to form new life, to bear fruit, he said, unless a grain of wheat go into the ground and die, it remains only a single seed. But he wasn't just talking about seeds. He was talking about himself. And he was talking about the fact that he had to die and to die for our sins. And this little garden that I have made here tells us a little bit about that Easter story. There are three crosses on a hill reminding us that Jesus died on a cross. The greatest expression of how much he loves us, how he loves me, how he loves you, is that he died on a cross for our sins. It 
it's a sad thing that Jesus died and yet we can be glad that he took our sins on himself and that we can be his because of what he has done and because we as we reflect on the cross we realize just how much he loves us when Jesus died his followers put his body in the tomb and they closed it over and they were sad too and on Easter Sunday morning early in the morning the women came to the tomb and they discovered that instead of the stone being across the entrance it had been rolled away because the reality was that Jesus was no longer dead he had risen and that is the wonderful good news of Easter that we have a friend and Savior Jesus who is not dead but he's alive know he's a Jesus who loves us so much he cares for us so much and he's also someone who is with us because he is alive he is risen from the dead that's what we celebrate a risen Savior a friend who is with us all the time because he's alive and he invites us to put our trust in him he invites us to celebrate today in the wonder of the resurrection and now we're going to sing a song that talks about all that Jesus came to do Lord I lift your name on high Praise band are now going to lead us uh, in a beautiful song that brings us into the heart of who Jesus is, reflecting on his beauty, his majesty, his wonderful name, the name that is above every other name. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Hidden core in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is! What a beautiful name it is! The name of Jesus Christ, right What a beautiful.
Bible reading is taken from John chapter 20. I'm going to read from verse 1 right through to verse 18. I would like to encourage you to follow along with it in your Bibles at home. And we're going to be looking at this passage together. And it's going to be read for us in dramatic form by the Wallace family. John chapter 20 verses 1 to 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped round Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realise that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Amen. As we watch the news, it will be easy to despair. As we hear stories of the coronavirus, it could easily get us down. And so much bad news can blind us to the possibility that there is another narrative, a story of hope symbolized by pictures of rainbows in the windows of homes. The rainbow, of course, is God's sign, given to Noah in the aftermath of the flood. It's a symbol not only of hope, but of new life. It's a particularly important signpost in times like these. As we join the Easter story this morning in that familiar passage, read to us by the Wallace family, we find Mary Magdalene on her way to the tomb of her Lord. She is downcast in despair. The one who transformed her life, who delivered her from her demons, is dead. She saw him die cruelly on a Roman cross. In a sense, this morning, we arrive at the resurrection, bypassing the crucifixion. The horror of that purposely public humiliation of the Son of God on a cruel cross on the thoroughfare outside Jerusalem, left almost to a sight because we didn't meet together on Good Friday to have our vigil around the cross. 
although I'm sure you reflected in your own homes. But Mary was there, along with the other woman, loyal to the end. And no one could have been unmoved by that scene, the dreadful way in which he died. The dignity of his final words, the grace and love poured out as his life ebbed away. And it's somebody you love as it was for Mary, and indeed had such an impact on her life, it was even tougher. Mary had hardly observed the requirements of the Sabbath. She was on her way to the tomb while it's still dark. As the American novelist Jim Bodwell said, the darkest dawn or the darkest hours just before the dawn. The darkness described by John reflects not only the early hour, but also that place where Mary finds herself. There's a sense of isolation. While the synoptic gospels provide evidence of other women coming to the tomb, John tells only of Mary, alone, forlorn, absorbed in her grief. Yet it is love, love for her Lord that brings her to the garden that morning. Perhaps Mary allowed herself to think over the events of the previous dark days. Physical darkness enveloped the land as Jesus breathed his last. It was as if all creation shuddered at the shocking events of Calvary. It appears that evil has triumphed, that those opposed to God have had their way and have had the final say. Mary, in a sense, represents all of us. All of us in our darkest hour, our lowest ebb. As Scott Hortz of Calvin College puts it, Mary Magdalene on Easter morning is an emblem of the whole human condition. Mary isn't once every single one of us and the whole lot of us taken together. And so it is precisely into that situation of dereliction that Easter must burst forth. It is precisely into that darkness and despair that we most need the light and hope of Christ. Suddenly, as Mary rounds the corner, she's confronted with something she has not expected. The open tomb, the stone rolled away. Without a second glance, she runs for Peter and the other disciple, presumably John, the author of this account. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they've put him, she blurts out. It's so easy to jump to conclusions. It's all too easy to latch on to conspiracy theories when we're looking for answers. It's all too easy to allow the truth to be obscured, negative stories to be propagated. All too easy for our understanding to be blinded by our limited perspective. That's what Mary does. And she gets it wrong. But we can understand, I'm sure, and sympathize with her. In the meantime, Peter and John run to the tomb. They look in. They see the evidence firsthand. They see the grave, stone, grave clothes. They quickly grasp the significance of the situation. This is not the work of grave robbers. Everything is too neat. John tells us that he believes. Exactly what he believes, we're not sure, for we're told that they still don't get it, that Jesus must rise from the dead. That this is all part of God's plan. The disciples leave the scene, but Mary remains weeping. She goes back to look inside the tomb. There she sees two angels in white who ask her why she is weeping. Her response expresses her pain and her ongoing incapacity to understand that something miraculous had happened. Her words, they have taken my Lord away. 
and I don't know where they have put him. Mary is still looking for a dead body. She is blinded by the possibility of another narrative. Then she turns and sees someone. He asks, why is she crying? Who is she looking for? Mary, thinking he is the gardener, asks, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Nothing, absolutely nothing, prepares her for what happens next. Mary, he says. Mary. With that, she recognises that it is Jesus. She reverts to her heart language, Rabboni. She responds in Aramaic, teacher. She is overjoyed, transformed. She is no longer looking for a body. In that tender word, the speaking of her name, Jesus conveys so, so much. He conveys how much she is valued, how precious she is to him. He speaks her name. And when she hears it, she recognizes him. She hears a voice that is distinctive, life imparting, a voice of authority, a voice that calmed the storm that called Lazarus out of the tomb, who cast out her demons. Not only does Jesus speak her name, but he gives her a task. He gives her responsibility as a messenger of the good news. Go to my brothers and tell them, I'm ascending to my father and your father, to your God, to my God and your God. Jesus bestows dignity and value. He transforms Mary's situation. He transforms her life. And he wants to do the same for us. In her Pulitzer Prize winning book, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, the American novelist Anne Dillard relates how with the discovery of cataract operations, skilled, skilled surgeons traveled around performing the procedure. A German doctor recorded the reaction of people who received their sight in a book entitled Space and Sight, in which he deals with the perception of people before and after the operation. People who may have been born with sight problems. And Anne Dillard tells of one girl who had been given sight who put it this way. I have been my whole life a bell and never knew it until at that moment I was lifted and struck. I had been my whole life a bell and never knew it until at that moment I was lifted and struck. Mary was a bell, fashioned and beautiful, but now she's been lifted and struck. Everything has changed. She has value and purpose. Instead of despair, there is hope. In the place of darkness, the light of Jesus illuminates her life. Instead of despondency, a new purpose, a new role, and a mission to perform. And a huge deal in those days, given that she's a woman. Jesus empowers her puts faith in her, gives her a purpose, and she's no longer looking for a dead body. She's with the living Christ. In this story, we see the heart of the gospel. Mary's search for a dead savior, in a sense, symbolizes a religion based on adherence to rules and regulations. Many people looking for religion on their terms or following the rule of an ethical teacher who's no longer with us. Jesus, on the other hand, is living, is offering a living relationship with a living God, one who's conquered sin and death, one who can give us freedom from sin and new life in all its fullness. Mary has been searching, but in a sense in all the wrong places. She jumped to conclusions, the wrong conclusions. But in her search, it was Jesus who found her. And it's always Jesus who finds us. 
Way back in Galilee, when Jesus called his disciples, Philip went to his friend Nathaniel and said, we have found the Messiah. When Jesus sees Nathaniel, he says, before, I, before Philip called you, I saw you. That wonderful hymn, Amazing Grace, will be applicable to Mary. For this is a story of grace. Mary experienced grace when Jesus cast out her demons, seven demons, conveying completeness. Mary, in a sense, was completely deranged. But Jesus had delivered her. Now in the garden, Jesus, in his grace, meets her and transforms her life. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Jesus has found her. Jesus has restored her. He has utterly transformed her life. He has saved her from darkness and despair, from demons and sin, from wanderingly, wandering aimlessly, looking for that which was not there. People sometimes ask, what difference the resurrection makes. It makes all the difference in the world. The cross, sorry, the resurrection validates all that Jesus did on the cross. It represents victory rather than defeat. It draws our focus to Jesus as God's son, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It brings home to us the futility of our own efforts and opens up for us the wonder of grace. Grace that we all need. For the story of Mary is the story of our lives. We too need to encounter the risen Jesus to accept his saving grace. He calls your name. It's that personal. He's telling you that you matter. That he has a purpose and a mission for you. His death for you makes all the difference. You simply need to trust that his finished work on the cross is for you. Often we underestimate the significance of the resurrection. Like Mary, we're blind to the enormity of what happened that first Easter Sunday morning. That which happens and still reverberates down through history. We're invited to follow a risen Saviour. A Saviour who gave his life on the cross for our forgiveness. That we would be restored to full relationship with God. The personal language of this passage, passage emphasises the personal relationship with God. That relationship that God wants with each of us and which Jesus makes possible. Jesus' resurrection transforms the darkness and despair, bringing light and hope into our lives, into a world that so desperately needs it. And we find our purpose, our true identity, when we are found by the risen Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to sing a wonderful hymn now that reflects on all that Jesus has done, reflects on the resurrection life that he gives. Jesus Christ is risen today.
work of Christ in our lives, all that he has achieved on the cross, all that we have benefited from in his death and resurrection is reflected in this song, again sung by the praise group, and are yet not I.
one of the privileges that we have, even when we're apart, is that we can pray. And there are many opportunities to do that. And again, I want to remind you that we're happy to pray for you and any particular situation for yourself, for a loved one. Uh, if you would like prayer, please do let us know. And now we're going to take time to pray uh, and reflect on God and who he is, inviting him to be at work in our lives. And Colin McLean is going to lead us in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today in prayer. We live in a world filled with worry, anguish and pain. Many are suffering at the hands of the COVID-19 virus. Many are suffering through necessary isolation from those close to them, and many through the despair of having lost those dearest to themselves. Abba Father, on this wonderful day, the day when our Lord rose from the grave, May we be reminded of the words of the psalmist David, Thou art with me, thy rod and staff, they comfort me. We may not be able to gather in our meeting house, but we are gathered through your gift of technology in our homes. May we be reminded that the church is not the buildings, but it is your people. We give thanks for being able to come together as your covenant people. At this time, we pray for those unable to access this live stream. May your hands be upon them and may they be comforted by the presence of the Holy Spirit. May they too know the fellowship that this brings. We pray for your support and touch for key workers. We especially remember the NHS workers, doctors, nurses, ancillary staff, those providing logistical support. We ask that you are with them, that the Holy Spirit fills them with your love and support as they work to conquer the virus. We also remember the shop workers, the delivery drivers, the bus drivers, our police and fire service and the armed forces. Lord, bring us together as a nation, a people bonded by the desire to serve and help, just as your son taught us. We pray for our leaders at this time. We remember our government, both here in Northern Ireland and at Westminster. Our denomination spans the border, and we also pray for the Dublin government. May you speak into their hearts, and may their decisions be well judged and without personal regard. At this time, we remember Her Majesty the Queen. May her faithful service and firm faith in you be an example to us all. We would also bring our Prime Minister Boris to you. He is but one of many suffering due to the virus and is an example of how the virus does not discriminate. Just as you, Lord, do not see position or power, but you see us all as your children, for whom you have amazing, unconditional love. Lord, we pray for our own congregation. We pray not only for those suffering from the COVID-19 virus, but also for those who have recently suffered bereavement in their family. May you be present in their every waking hour and may they draw comfort today from the true knowledge of our Lord having risen from the dead. We pray for those suffering many other illnesses and conditions. May you be a comfort to them as their recovery and daily life is made even more difficult in these times. We remember James and Elaine at this time. Lord, may they know our prayers during their time of furlough. May they know that they are very much part of the church family and that your arms are around them always. We remember David, who continues to maintain our buildings and also our teaching elder Richard. May you continue to fill him with your spirit that he may teach, challenge and guide us at this time. Lord, we pray for your wider world. We live in a time of a global pandemic. No part of your world is untouched, and we pray at this time for our denominational mission workers worldwide. May they know our support as they feel even more isolated. We also bring to you our brothers and sisters in Furnosh and Transcarpathia. We remember Attila, the elders and our brothers and sisters whom we know so well. We remember Yori, Elizabeth, Nellie and all our friends in Transcarpathia. 
May your hands be upon them and may our prayers be uplifting to them. Finally, Lord, may we be reminded today of Budri's words, Thine be the glory, risen conquering Son. Endless is the victory, Thou, or death, has won. I ask this prayer in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, our risen Saviour. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen.